I would like to use one scripture to introduce really what will be the text and the main point of our lesson this morning. And that sermon is entitled, The Mind of Christ. Mind of Christ. But before we get to the scripture that is actually the text to that sermon, I want us to be reminded of why that John wrote his first epistle. Keeping in mind it was written to Christians. Most of the New Testament is written to Christians. It's written to us telling us how we are to think, how we are to live, do's and don'ts, in practical, faithful Christian living. And John wrote in 1 John chapter 1, and we'll read through verse 4. And just picture in your mind the people of the first century actually going to receive this letter and how they would have maybe in a situation like this heard it read to them originally. And John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Comment about that, coupled with the remarks I made before read it, read it. We must realize our brethren of 2,000 years ago did not live in a friendly atmosphere, world, culture, or society when it came to acceptance and toleration of Christianity. The church was born, if you want to call it that, into a hostile environment. We don't know what it's like to live in that environment. And you know, the Lord never did say, because you're in such an environment, your obligations are lessened. Your responsibilities are different. What he did say was take up your cross and follow me. The old country western song of years ago said, I never promised you a rose garden. And that's the way it is with our Lord's teaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the disciples and especially the apostles regarding what it was going to be like to be faithful in the church when he established it. To be a real, genuine, faithful Christian as the New Testament defines that word. He did give them the wherewithal to get through all manner of trouble that came upon them, especially because they were faithful to God. The New Testament has anticipated, because it's God's will, every trouble and problem that would ever come up in your life or my life, and it's given the answer to them. But it requires faith built upon that word that God knows how to do that. And it may not look like it to us, but if you'll just think of who we are and where we are and our limitations, he does know. It's up to us to have faith in him that he can do it as our faith is built upon a thus saith the Lord proposition. John says, I'm writing to you as, a, as an apostle so that you can have fellowship with the apostles. That's what the we means and the us means. We have fellowship with God and Christ. And we want you to have fellowship with God and Christ. Now turning to that because the mind of Christ in you and in me is the only way that's going to happen. And Paul had this to say in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you. I remind you, let is the force of a commandment. It's not going to happen unless you want it. It's not going to take place in your life by just simply saying, 
this is the way it ought to be, this is the way the Bible says it is. It's going to take from the heart profound changes in your attitude and in your mind, which beginning profound change is that you will take the Lord and His Word and comply with it regardless of what things look like around you. Paul says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Well, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, and we're to walk by faith and not by sight, then we're to walk or live as the New Testament teaches us to live. That's how you walk by faith. That's how you live by faith. So Paul had this to say, again to Christians of 2,000 years ago who lived in this same hostile environment, let this mind be in you. Now I'm going to see he means the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ, the outlook of Christ. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. And given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and of things in earth. And things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now concerning the likeness of a father and a son. We've heard statements like this. Like father, like son. Or maybe something like he's a chip off the old block. And other terms like that. They're all those sayings that are pithy sayings. But yet they're rooted in truth. That's designed in this case to talk about the likeness of a son to the father. To say this then is to declare that the son's a copy, a reproduction, or a replica of the father. Thus, they like the same things. They have the same values. They have the same appearance when it comes to physical matters. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul said to the church there, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now let me drive a peg down there just for a moment. If you set your mind earnestly and honestly to live as the New Testament says you're to live, that Christ may be seen in you, in your actions, in what you do and don't do, and so on. You have... However long you live on this earth, chronologically speaking, you have the greatest challenge that you'll ever face here on earth. In this passage, we are informed of the need to be very close, to be intimate with Christ. You can't do that if you don't know his word. You can't do that if you don't spend much time, as the song says, in secret with Jesus alone. You can't endure the sufferings that you must endure and that God expects you to endure, whatever they may be, for all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's easy said, isn't it? But understanding that the Lord meant what He said and said what He meant, that means I've got to understand that's going to happen to me and to you if I live, like the Bible says, consistently throughout my life. So we need to be... Uh, chip off of the old cornerstone when it comes to these things. Too many times we fall back on the fact that we're fleshly and we see things as people of the world who do not have the mind of Christ. We don't seem to have the faith that says God knows what he's doing. If I will just do my part and that part set out in the New Testament and at the moment it's being done, it may not look too good. Have you thought how the disciples viewed Christ on the cross when he cried out, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Because they, they had forsaken him. Can you imagine how it looked right then, as far as anything the Lord taught Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in his earthly ministry, as to how that's going to work out? Everything quite bleak, wasn't it? Very bleak. 
God's behind the scenes. He's working it. And in fact, with what happened at the cross, it was exactly in the plan of God. Exactly in the plan of God. Just because we mere finite, weak human beings can't line it all up the way we think it ought to be li lined up, then we falter. We bring burdens on us that are unnecessary. We need to be a replica of Christ as we are members of His spiritual body. We should face whatever we face as Christ would face it. We should see all things as Christ saw them. Now, why do we need to be this replica? Why, Jesus is our flawless, perfect example or pattern. It's that simple. Just say in your mind, well, I'm not going to follow Jesus as a pattern by complying with the will of his New Testament. Who are you going to follow? You're going to follow somebody. You're going to think as you're taught to think. You're going to act either like the world in trouble are you going to act like a Christian, one who's of Christ, a member of his spiritual body, with the mind of Christ? You have no choices. If you do have a choice, what is it? It's either face the world. By the way, that means facing yourself first. Face the world in the light of the perfect law of liberty, the mind of Christ. Or face the world like the world does. In 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22, here's what Peter said. Now, we talked about John, Paul, now Peter, and yet all of them were guided by the same Holy Spirit infallibly to write down the will of God for us that we might have the mind of Christ and thus live according to that mind of Christ. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. He says, For even here and who were you called? What's well, the gospel that called us? Called us to be Christians. Called us to have the mind of Christ. Called us to live by the authority of the New Testament. He said, specifically regarding suffering. A lot of the suffering we undergo is brought on by ourselves. And much of that's brought on because we just don't really trust God's word when it comes to things working out. We just don't. We begin to trust in everything else and ponder and wonder and whatever else. No, for you're even here unto where you called. Because Christ also suffered for us. Well, in doing so, what does it say? Leaving us an example, and that's a pattern, that we should follow in his steps. Now, look at that. That we should follow in his steps. His steps of what? Suffering. Didn't Paul say, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Which means he lived up to what God called him to be, to be able to save us from our sins. Well, we're of his spiritual body, members in particular. How should we live? We see again back to what we started with in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, that Paul tells us here that we are to have the mind of Christ. We see that. Paul tells us in this context what it takes, what it takes on your behalf and mine, to have, to possess the mind of Christ. To have the mind of Christ is to have a mind of sacrifice. Frankly, in bountiful America, where everything is convenient, and a lot of times we don't even think about moving somewhere because we think of the convenience we already enjoy. Convenience in worldly things, in reaching them. And does that mean I'm opposed to that? No, I'm just saying that's the mindset of people where we are. Our Lord sacrificed the blessings of heaven for us. Now, there's no way, folks, that I can begin, if I studied the Bible a thousand years and prayed several hours a day, that I can begin to understand what he left when he left heaven. But here, here's the interesting thing. When he left heaven, he came to earth, and he came as a man, just like you, just like me, with the same needs, same desires, so he could save us from our sins, which we got ourselves into because we wouldn't listen to God in the first place. That's how sin entered the world. And death by sin. Yet he entered a world that he created. He's the executor of the Father's will. John tells us in his gospel that all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made. So he executed the Father's will in material creation and in the spiritual creation. His church. Christ built his church. And when I think about that...
That means he saw a world that he made without sin and it. Man came along without sin and yet man would not trust him to keep one commandment and sin into the world. And by the time Christ came as a man into the world, the world was well polluted. Read Romans 1 because of man's sin. So he didn't just come into the world he made. He came into the world to save sinners who had loused this world up in as bad a way as you could. Have you ever built something or maybe cleaned something up very well and it was so hard to get it done and then to have somebody mess it all up? How would you feel about that? Just a little thing like that. Well, that's this world our Lord came into. And man, he messed it up because he let sin get in the world, the devil's influence, because he disobeyed God. He sinned. But Christ came into that world, and he still lived a sinless life, being tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. Now, we're the product of what he did for us we can never do for ourselves. You all and your little children, and that's the same is true of most of our parents, you were taken care of when you were at that age when you could not take care of yourself. Now that's what Christ did when he came into the world. He did for us what we never could do for ourselves. When you consider what the Bible says about his suffering, and the song we sing sometimes based on that, how he groaned on the tree. That he would take nothing on that tree of crucifixion that would dull his senses because he sought to suffer to the uttermost and be fully conscious because he was satisfying God's justice. I would read Isaiah 53 here because it's a perfect place for it, but I'll call on you to do that. I will say this of it, the prophet Isaiah the Messianic prophet, 700 years before Christ, and part of that re reading in Isaiah 53, said that with his stripes, we are healed. And he points out that when God the Father saw the sacrifice of his son, he was satisfied. Now, maybe we don't think about that like we ought to, but we're in, a, in an institution, and members in particular, that was created because Christ did that. Now, of great significance here is the word humbled. It comes from a word that is so important. And I want to look at these points here to introduce up further in the verse to that word humbled. Jesus counted not the being on an equality with God as a thing to be grasped, or as it said in the King James, robbery to be equal with God. He was God as much as the Father and Holy Spirit and all that that means. He's in the form of God. Jesus is identical to God. Jesus gave up all, as I mentioned earlier, of the comforts, whatever all that means to us, I doubt we understand it, of heaven to be a servant on earth to subject himself to Satan to hurt as we hurt he did it perfectly he's our example in Hebrews 4.15 for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin what a thought that is Jesus gave up his life for one reason and one reason only, for you and for me and all men. Jesus left the perfection of heaven to go to the pain and anguish of the cross, the agony of the cross, to undergo those terrible trials. All of it was unjust. He was scourged, and that's enough there to, to shake you up. He didn't have to. He didn't have to at all. And he endured the cross. John 10, 17 through 18 reads, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. To have the mind of Christ then means that we must 
have a mind of sacrifice, of giving up things that are important to us in this life for the cause of Christ. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, most familiar passage to Bible students, Paul writes to the members of the church at Rome, and so to every one of us, I beseech you, that is, I'm on bended knee begging you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, considering how God's been merciful to every one of us, that ye present your bodies, that's my responsibility, a living sacrifice, holy and dedicated to Him, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. I must not allow myself to be conformed with the way the world operates. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I don't know if anybody here has ever bit into and tasted a green persimmon. But it's going to make you pucker when you don't want to pucker. Well, there are some of my brethren in the church, Christians, who should have the mind of Christ. But their life is like it just bit off and continually chews on a green persimmon. They're dissatisfied with themselves. They're dissatisfied with everybody else. They can't get done what they want done. They're not thinking about God's will being done. And they don't think about the impact they have on others. But well, we do. Somebody says, well, he lost his influence. No, you never lose your influence. You either exercise by the way you live and what you say. Good influence over people. And that is the definition of influence. The power you have over others by the way you live. Or else you have bad influence. But you never lose your influence. So we must be willing to sacrifice, to give up things that are very important to us here. Worldly pleasures, family, friends, social status. Those things some of us have given up a long time ago. I remember Brother Nichols saying a long time ago that, you know, once he decided that God said that he was to be in the worship assemblies, he never ever had a problem after that to saying on Saturday night, well, will I go to church tomorrow? He said, I made up my mind that was a part of my duty to God a long time ago. Whenever the first day of the week rolled around, I was there. Never had to set and make my mind up on those things. That's the way it is in everything pertaining to faithful Christians. If you're faithful, and that's the key. To have the mind of Christ is to have the mind of humility. And that's where I said we were going with this. Paul says in verse 8 that we've read, but we'll read it again for emphasis. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In other words, Jesus knew when he left heaven, that's the way it was going to be. He knew that before he got there. There's no surprises in what Jesus did for him. In comparison, this would be like a man taking on the form of a worm. Think about that for a minute. Taking on the form of a worm. Now, you don't usually think of yourself as a worm, but maybe that's where part of the problem is. Because when compared to Christ, that's exactly what I am. David even used that word in some song that was written about that. Remove the word worm and just simply said, such a one as I. But the old song used to say, such a worm as I. I actually had a man one time take offense at me using a worm and talking about men in the sight of God and our sinfulness, that we're but a worm. But he was a good song leader. Guess what he ended up singing? He sang that song one day that said, such a worm as I. And I never will forget the look on his face. Well, if he'd read his Bible, and if he had believed it, and he was regular in believing it by studying it, he would know known better than ever opposed that anyway. Of great significance is the word humbled. It comes from a word meaning to make low, to bring to the ground. Humiliation would be our closest English word. Jesus was humiliated. Jesus was dishonored. Jesus was disgraced. Jesus, by those He came to save, was shamed in taking on the form of a man and becoming us. Our Lord suffered the humiliation on a daily basis. Now question, have you ever been humiliated? Well, you'll have to think about that. 
But James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and He shall lift you up. There's a song we sing mainly with the young people that puts that to music. Luke 14, 11 says, humble yourselves. I got to do it. You can't do it for me. You can set a good example for me in how to do it. But I must actually do that for myself. Humble yourselves on the side of God and he shall lift you up. So we must, for the cause of Christ, for living according to the truth of Christ, as members of the body of Christ, expect humiliation. It's so amazing to me is that, well, they just humiliated me. Well, didn't you expect it? You're a Christian, aren't you? Aren't you a member of the spiritual body of Christ? Didn't Christ tell you that you would undergo the same thing that he did? Well, if it's anything, it's a sign you're doing what's right. You're being faithful to him. In Acts 5, 41, and they departed from the presence of the council. Now listen. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I don't think I've ever suffered like they did. But over the years, I know I've gone through some of this. If you will notice what Paul said in Perils of False Brethren, and they can shame you. They can humiliate you. They can make you sad. They can make you hurt. Who crucified Christ? The very ones who should have above all people on this earth by 1,500 years of the law of Moses, which Paul says was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. They should have recognized their Messiah. But Peter declares on the day the church was started in Acts 2, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified the Son of God. And these were devout religious people. These weren't pagans. But they had sinned. And I'm glad they were honest. Because the scripture says in Acts 2 verse 37, before the sermon was actually over, they were pricked in their heart and cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What humiliation. What humbleness. Romans 8, 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Why is that in your Bible? What do you learn from it? To have the mind of Christ is to have the mind of obedience. There's where the rub really is. We want to have the mind of Christ, but obedience and everything enjoined upon us by our Lord is just not a part of us. There are multitudes of members of the church who can tell you, even some can't do that, but they can tell you this verse is in the Bible and here's what it means. But then when it comes down to practical application in everyday matters, they don't seem to make the connection. And having, found, having been found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Again, that's in our re reading. Jesus had a mind of obedience. Jesus said in John 4, 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat or food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish my work. Now question, as a member of the spiritual body of Christ that he purchased with his own blood, to which he added us, when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, do we have that disposition toward my individual personal responsibility to the Lord? And that is that um, I'm going to do what's right, as the Bible defines the right as a Christian, until my work's finished. I'm going to do what God expects of me. Because if I don't, you'll never hear be the uh, well done, faithful. Good and faithful. That's what I mean. You stuck with it. You didn't give up. You trusted in Christ on the basis of His will. You didn't try to substitute your own will. You didn't put up some sort of front and then when push comes to shove, you backed off because it required too much personal sacrifice on your part. No, you, you have the mind of Christ. You follow in His steps. And we sometimes sing, evidently a lot don't believe it, footsteps of Jesus which make the pathway glow. They don't make glow for some folks. Obedience is that for which he strongly hungered and thirsted. And we'll never know the Bible until we have that disposition to want to learn it. It's not something you read and walk out. You meditate on it day and night. It was his very reason for being was to do the Father's will. John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. God expects that of you and me. Jesus was also always concerned about doing the Father's will. 
Jesus was not concerned about what he wanted. But he was concerned about what the Father wanted him to do. To save me from my sins. And to save you. And to create the church. John 17, 4. He says in that prayer, For I have glorified thee, that's the Father, on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. You realize what a thought that when you finish, have you ever worked on something forever and finally finished it? How'd you feel? Well, that's what we're doing to be faithful in the church, whether we're in the church 10 years or 50. We're living like the New Testament said. Brethren, it'll be a relief to lay down and take off this battle scar armor and say, It is finished. And I know it was to Christ in grave pain and anguish. I've done what I can do. I can't do any more. I've glorified the Father through His obedience. That is, Jesus has. Jesus did not leave His Father's work undone. It was all He had on His mind. All arrangements He made was to do what the Father wanted. In John chapter 19 and verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished. And bowed His head and gave up the ghost. Jesus would not let even death keep him from obeying his Father. So what will it take to keep us from being obedient? Only you can ask that. We must have a mind of obedience. It is said in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, and remember to whom it was originally written, Jews who obeyed the gospel, but through persecution, were actually thinking about leaving the New Testament system and going back under the law. This was written, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Jesus became perfect in obedience. How do you think we become perfect in obedience? We must be obedient if we want to be saved from our sins and go to heaven. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Are you troubled? Christ can answer how to get out of it. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When our Lord did what he did sacrificially that only he could do, and Peter said he's left us a pattern or an example to walk in his steps, it's no wonder when we choose to reject him or after having obeyed the gospel, become unfaithful, that we would receive this from Him. For we've spurned the best could be, of which there can be no better. So punishment awaits the disobedient, whether they never obey the gospel, or whether in the church they cease to live according to it. Could there be a greater reason than this, to have a mind of obedience and cultivate it? In 1 John 3, verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because, we keep His commandments and do those things which are pleasing in His sight. If that's not your goal, you need to do some mind readjustment and do it quickly. There are rewards for obedience, rewards in this life, and most importantly, eternal life to come in heaven with God. As we bring the lesson to its close, notice what the end result was of Jesus having a mind of sacrifice and obedience a mind of humility. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Wherefore God hath also exalted, highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that, at the, same, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Father exalted Jesus because he was humble, because he was sacrificial, because he was obedient. That's the way it works for you and me in his spiritual body. In the end, everyone will know that Jesus is the Christ, and everyone will give him glory. The sad thing is, for many, it'll be too late. And they'll do it, but it won't help them. They'll still be lost. Because the time of salvation, God's outstretched hand to us, is now in the flesh in this life. There's only one time you go through this life. And that's the only time you're going to have to show God you love Him with all that you are and that you will serve Him with all that you have and are. We must have the mind of Christ as taught in the Scriptures of the perfect law of liberty. 
and we'll be exalted in due time. We have the mind of Christ when we show sacrifice, when we show that we're humble, and when we show that we're obedient. So I simply end where I began. Uh, do we have the mind of Christ in all things? If you're not a Christian, then we hope you'll become one this morning by believing that Christ is the Son of God based on the testimony of His Word, Romans 10, 17. That you will repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in the Christ, thinking about what that means in view of this study. And then to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins as He teaches in Acts 2, 38. If as a Christian, you've lost sight of having that mind of Christ and that the New Testament is the mind of Christ and His Word by our submission to it, creates the mind of Christ in us. And if you know in your life there are those things that are amiss, then humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Ask for forgiveness, having confessed those sins. And God is just, and He's true, and He's looking for you so He can forgive you when you show forth that humbleness and obedience. So if you need to come to Christ now, we ask you to do so while we stand and sing.